Welcome back, everybody. Today we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Fabio De Masi, economist, uh, candidate for the Sarah Balinkert Alliance uh, for the 2024 European elections, uh, former member of the European Parliament uh, and of the German Bundestag. Uh, Sarah Wagenknecht Alliance uh, is, in our opinion, at the moment, uh, one of the most uh, interesting new political parties. So it's a very big pleasure to have you with us, uh, uh, Fabio, and uh, thanks for accepting our invitation. Grazie per l'invito. Thank you. So, um, two years after the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, uh, Germany is now in a recession for the first time in the post-war period. Um, industrial production is falling and investments are flying the, to the United States. Uh, so Germany is the country that has probably invested the most uh, in this uh, NATO proxy war against uh, Russia. Uh, but at the same time, we can see that uh, it's clearly against its own interests. Uh, so how do you explain this uh, contradiction? Yes, indeed. Um, German, German energy dependence, for example, has been um, very high on, 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 on Russia. And now we are um, importing more and more, for example, liquefied um, natural gas from the United States. Uh, which has a, a very problematic environmental impact as well. Um, energy prices uh, have been rising. And on top of that, our government is uh, pursuing policy of uh, austerity, cutting um, expenditures, cutting public investment in the middle of a recession. Um, so that's a very, very some development. And um, for sure, um, the 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 Russian um, the the Russian attack on Ukraine territory is a clear violation of um, uh, of, of international law. Um, however, the conflict also has a very complex history, as we know, and um, it has always been discussed, uh, even among members of the Social Democratic Party, with its complexities um, prior to the war. But when the Russian intervention started, there was a high um, pressure in, 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 in politics and in media to basically um, frame this conflict as if there was there was no other uh, route to be taken um, than to engage in a, in, a, in a long and devastating war, which in my opinion um, is uh, sacrificing uh, a lot of uh, Ukrainian lives and is actually risking of um, sacrificing more of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty, because as we know, it is uh, a reality um, in international politics that we have um, powerful nuclear powers and that there has been always a, a policy of um, a security buffer. And uh, Russia has over the years always made it very clear that um, they wish to maintain that buffer. There were international disarmament treatments, which have been canceled also by uh, Donald Trump, the INF treaty, for example. And I think that um, there is too little political capital invested on finding a diplomatic um, solution to, to, to this conflict. And the interesting uh, development that we can observe now is that in the United States, we can already see a backtracking um, on the um, uh, financing of the Ukrainian armament. Um, it's being blocked in the U.S. budget. Uh, there is uh, increasing pressure also on Biden. We, we, we had very interesting statements by one of the leading um, foreign policy advisors of uh, former President Obama in a German newspaper who basically made it very clear that he thinks uh, we need to prepare and pave the way for negotiations. And the tragic thing is that even uh, leading Ukrainian diplomats have indeed uh, spoken out that in March 2022, so one month basically after the Russian intervention, which I repeat myself is a grave breach of international law, that one month after that intervention, uh, there, there had been uh, talks uh, uh, in Istanbul, which were very close um, to, to being finalized which would have probably preserved more of the Ukraine territory because the problem is no matter how many 
weapons uh, we would send uh, to Ukraine, um, Russia has a sheer abundant supply of people. And um, so we think it's also in the best interest of the Ukraine to find such a diplomatic solution. So while in the US, we already have a change of tone um, and we probably will face a situation where uh, Donald Trump might win the elections and then they basically um, confront us with this dire situation in Europe. And the reaction of our government has been, for example, that we have a so-called debt break and trend in the constitution, which curtails mm, public investment, which curtails the ability to, um, to finance public investment uh, via, via credit. Um, and interestingly, this debt break um, puts a lot of pressure on, on the welfare state, on public investment, uh, VAT has been raised, uh, environmental levies have been raised, which primarily target people uh, with low and middle income households. This, ha this has contributed to 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 rise of the right wing AFD in the polls. And amid this situation, the German Chancellor, who is at least more cautious on um, on delivering uh, uh, um, um, long range weapons long-range missiles. However, also him, he said basically that uh, we will only um, we will only circumvent the debt break if it is needed that the US completely ends its commitments and Ukraine needs more money for the war. And this confronts the German population with a situation where they have the feeling that for our social needs, for the development of our domestic economy, there's no investment undertaken. But if Trump basically uh, puts the whole war in front of our feet, only then um, this, this debt break will be attacked. And I think this policy mix is really dangerous and disastrous. And the only explanation uh, for me is that um, the, basically the, uh, the, the political and mediatic pressures and, and transatlantic networks have been very strong in pushing that that agenda, which is self-devastating for the German economy. Ali, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. okay. And um, um, I'd say that um, uh, one of the most striking cases of what you were saying was the terrorist attack against the Nord Stream because um, uh, many claim that Germany is well aware uh, of the fact that uh, it was an operation wanted and organized by NATO allies. Um, so what's, what's your idea uh, and how, how is it possible that Germany did not react in any way to uh, what is an uh, act uh, of war, uh, um, a kind of act of war against, uh, against Germany? Yes, it's a very striking case because um, we even have live footage from the White House when Chancellor Scholz stood next to President Joe Biden and, and, and Biden basically said, there was a question I think by a journalist, um, how the US would react if, if, if Germany would basically continue its energy relationship um, via Nord Stream. And, um, Interestingly enough, um, Joe Biden said in a very yeah, um, blatant manner, um, trust me, we'll be able uh, to take it out. Uh, there were like similar statements by Victoria Newland, who recently now um, uh, stepped down as, as, a, um, uh, 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 as, a, as a U.S. foreign policy official. And so I think that there was... A strong, um, it is an indication of how limited um, our own policy sovereignty is on the level of our government, because I think Europe has political interests that are different from the United States. We are basically a buffer between the East and the West. Um, Germany's export economy, however problematic it was also um, uh, in, the, in the European context, we had these like high export surplus that also cost problems also for Italy, for example, in the Euro crisis. But nevertheless, um, our whole industry, our car industry, for example, depends on economies of scale and, and a lot of um, 
linkages with foreign markets uh, because you can not only sell your cars domestically, obviously, it's a very expensive industry to, to, to entertain. And so the genetic code of the German industry has been strong ties with the East and the West because we are like a middle power in the center of Europe with linkages with China, with Russia. And um, in that regard, with that uh, attack on the energy infrastructure, uh, you can see how limited, um, obviously, the willingness of the German political establishment is to also defi define their own um, political interests and really even exert pressure on um, in the international arena to have proper investigations. Now, a few Scandinavian countries have uh, stopped their investigations in that matter. And I think the German political establish establishment understood immediately how dangerous um, the situation is because it's hard to explain that you uh, deliver weapons and money to a country when uh, some of your NATO allies or wh whoever is responsible for that attack your energy infrastructure. And um, also German federal police has clearly said, opposed to what in the beginning has been tried to 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 suggest that Russia would have any interest to do that because also that was uh, a take in some of the media outlets but even like the most high ranking uh, German federal investigators have refuted that uh, claim absolutely so yeah that's a very absurd situation because uh, such an attack on energy infrastructures is indeed an act of war and um uh, that brings me to a second point, which I think in this context is is relevant. Uh, there was recently a very interesting um, talk given by um, uh, by by James Gombrace, the 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 um, Keynesian um, renowned Keynesian um, uh, economist from the United States, from the University of um, uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, his his father is the once. Um, uh, highly uh, well-known uh, economic advisor of John F. Kennedy. And he uh, gave, he delivered a paper to the Institute of New Economic Thinking, uh, which is a think tank, uh, I think, in the United Kingdom, and made an assessment of um, also the energy policy and the, and the, and the sanctions regime uh, towards Russia. And he basically came to the conclusion that uh, the sanctions partially have helped Russia in its shift towards wartime economy, because at the same time that we try to suppress our energy demand from Russia, there's only a limited supply of um, fossil energy worldwide, as we know, and there's only a limited capacity in the short run to substitute it with, let's say, alternative energies and other sources of energy. So it's very clear what will happen if you have a limited supply, but you have the same level of demand, then basically, um, you just, you know, like you shift the, the supply of energy uh, to, to some other countries and then we are starting to import, for example, oil from Russia via Saudi Arabia, but at higher prices, which is not a, a very coherent policy. And um, the, the Russian economy was heavily colonized by Western firms before that war. And now because Western firms have been pushed out in the in the short run um and and they they had to leave their capital and and and, and part of their uh, intellectual property in russia and this actually helped russia to capitalize on this capital stock which under normal conditions they would have never been able to do also because of the grip of the oligarchs um and they would never had the authority to um to to kick all these Western firms out. So basically, Galbraith argues that um, this supposedly puzzle that German economy is in a deep crisis and the Russian economy is growing um, is perfectly explainable um, because uh, you can simply not, um, if you are dependent on, 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 on a limited range of suppliers of, of, of energy, um, you cannot simply substitute that in the, in, a, in the short run. So I believe that also our policy was self-defeating. And a third um, important um, aspect is that it the sanctions were never designed um, with a realistic chance of shortening the war, 
because uh, actually the Russian war machine is funded. Uh, Putin pays his soldiers in Russian ruble. He doesn't need our euros that we pay for, 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 for gas supplies or whatsoever in order to fund the war. Um, he might have some problems to import certain high-end uh, technology, but you, you could see actually how adaptable the Russian economy was so far as a wartime economy and how actually it helped um, Putin's grip on the oligarchs to enforce certain kind of wartime industrial policies that under normal conditions he would have never been able to push through. So I think that we're actually um, to some extent helping Russia and hurting ourselves and that's also a policy that um, that that uh, has a lot of um, backslash in the German population. A lot of people um, do not think that uh, this is the way um, to actually uh, uh, help our own e economic interests. You were talking about pressure from NATO, no? But how it actually works. I mean, what level of the state and the military you think is most involved in receiving the pressure from the NATOs and imposing it on the politically elected uh, elite? Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not part of the conversation that Mr. Scholz has with Mr. Biden, but I think um, there is not even somebody who like picks up the phone and, and tells them what to do. I think there is a kind of tacit understanding um, of, you know, in the first place, we had people like when Mr. Schultz was elected in office, he was never a person that was uh, like, you know, he never had a strong emphasis on a more independent policy stance uh, from the agenda of the United States in the first place. And if you were such a candidate, then there would be probably a lot of political and 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 uh, lobbying capital invested to attack you during an election campaign. So very often we already have a negative selection of candidates to a point that commit to a certain, you know, extent. I mean, our foreign foreign policy minister, Annalena Baerbock, um, she is, for example, um, I mean, she had from a very young age on, uh, she was in all these um, transatlantic uh, networks, uh, career networks, basically. And so I think to, to an extent there is um, like uh, in a sense of Gramsci, you know, like an, an, an an ideological environment uh, which is already created before you even come into office. Yes, we had somebody, let's say like Gerhard Schröder, who had a very uh, disastrous economic and social policies, but um, let's say on the Iraq war, uh, he formed a more independent stance. Um, he tried uh, to have certain um, uh, uh, diplomatic relationships with Russia, and there was a part of the German political elite that um, that uh, had a more um, like a stance of having good relationships with East and the West, but I think a lot of them also felt intimidated by the huge uh, political and media pressure. And also, also in the in the in the in the world of the media, we have journalists who uh, form part of these networks. There is a certain, let's say, um, how could I say? There is a certain climate also. Uh, in 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 media outlets, the journalists intrinsically they understand if I'm being too critical, maybe on the official line, uh, it will not bolster my career. You know, there's nobody telling them you have to write. You know, like uh, exactly this and that. Um, there is no like uh, uh, you know, there's nobody sitting at the telephone and calling them up. But there is um, a policy climate. And there's another instance where you can study that perfectly is the war in Gaza. Um, look, uh, even the, the official representative of the European Union on foreign policy, uh, Borrell, made uh, critical comments early on on the, um, on, the, uh, uh, on, the, on the war strategy of the Netanyahu government. And for example, uh, one of our governing parties, the Liberal Party, is the, the, the front runner to the European Parliament. She uh, shared posts that um, 
basically called Borrell, an official representative of the European Union, uh, um, to to have sympathies with Hamas. You know, like that's how radicalized sometimes the the, the foreign policy discourse in Germany. And I'm always wondering because. I spend a lot of my time abroad also in South Africa because I have strong relationships with South Africa. And if you go to other countries, to India, to China, to South Africa, basically to the majority of the world, there's a more complex and nuanced view on these conflicts. And if you think about the situation in Gaza, it's very interesting because also there we had a very limited space for discussions that certainly has to do with the terrible history of Germany um, in in relation to the Holocaust. However, um, you could see that even yeah, opinion pieces that would be very normal, let's say in the British BBC, you could not discover them in Germany until recently. And now that Biden for domestic political reasons started to change his tone towards Netanyahu, suddenly the green ministers and the government, which previously did not allow any this uh, concern with the Israeli government um, are now starting to also adopt their tone a little bit. And we are caught in this policy where at the same time we supply weapons to Israel and we supply food to Palestinians and we fly out children who lost their parents due to the bombings which is a completely schizophrenic situation because you're fooling the war machine and then you're trying to aid the victims of the war machine. And it's even the, the discussion, for example, on the Netanyahu government is more critical, I believe, in Israel itself. For example, um, Netanyahu uh, for a long time uh, um, uh, propped up Hamas for strategic reasons because he wanted to prevent a two-state solution um, uh, he explicitly um, used uh, the Israel military, despite warnings previously to the to the terrorist attack, to guard the illegal settlements uh, in the West Bank. So um, basically, uh, you could say that uh, Netanyahu and Hamas are uh, two sides of one coin, which necessitated each other and which had a kind of strategic alliance in, in preventing a rational um, solution to, to, this, to this ever going on conflict. And all these discussions that are like, at least you can have them even in the US corporate media, even in the UK, did not take place at all in Germany. And um, I think yesterday or two days ago, uh, uh, in the one of the leading German newspapers, Der Spiegel, there was a lead article which was really um, uh, an outright attack on the complicity of the German government. Uh, and uh, because Germany traditionally had a lot of good diplomatic relationships, not only with Israel due to, to, um, to our his historical um, responsibilities, but also with a lot of Arab states. We were seen as a credible mediator also because at least um, on a level of troops, we didn't participate uh, officially in the Iraq war. Um, our foreign minister, former FDP from the Liberal Party, um, said no to the to the participation in the war in Libya. And so we had a high political capital, which was destroyed uh, totally in this conflict. And this shows you how there is like a tacit understanding in the German media and political elite, a kind of self-censorship, not to expose itself until somebody is signaling it. And I could go on for hours if we talk about the debt break. You know, now the Green Party is attacking the debt break and there are more critical media reports about it. In 2017, they were asking leading um, financial policy makers of the Green Party were asking for a, a stricter debt break. And only since they see that it's, it's, it's now restricting their policy space during a war, now they're talking about exemption from the debt break for armament production. So there's always this like, it, it, it's guided by these like over overarching political goals. And only if, for example, Biden um, adopts a strategy, then all, also they will follow. And this shows you how we never gained a kind of uh, 
even not a limited, let's say, pan-European sovereignty in, 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 in policy. And that, that is really a tragic development because in my view, what will happen um, there is this word, uh, this word Zeitenwende in Germany, which means basically uh, a change of the epoch. There's a big shift, you know, historical shift. I think the true historical shift that a lot of the political media leads in Germany have not yet uh, comprehended is that in the world of tomorrow with China, with a lot of emerging economies, um, uh, the former colonial territories, they are not any more willing to accept um, a world which is uh, entirely governed by the West and they have the, the, the economic and foreign policy capital to um, to formulate their own political interests. And indeed, we should adapt to this new world. And what we will see is probably that the Trump administration is investing into a conflict between the United States and China. And that is part of the reason why the political right in the United States, Trump, is less interested in fighting the war in Ukraine, not because he is like a, a peace-loving activist Donald Trump, because he wants to invest his military and political capital on China, which is also a very dangerous development. And I think in this regard, a pragmatic assessment of European policymakers should be, we'll be left alone with this confrontation it should be in our interest to find a diplomatic uh, solution to this conflict because it will have huge economic and political costs, also internal domestic policy costs. Uh, we, we see how strong Le Pen is in France and in other countries. And the interesting thing is that this uh, leading former advisor of Obama said exactly that in an interview. He said he thinks that the internal policy repercussions from continuing that strategy in Ukraine are much more dangerous for Europe than Vladimir Putin. And um, I think that the European political establishment is so limited in their space to think. There are few exceptions. The former French foreign minister de Villepin, for example, is one of the few exceptions that we will we will be left with a Trump administration, we'll be left with the destructions, a completely destroyed Ukraine, the huge economic costs of the war, and no real strategy to form an independent um, an independent policy sovereignty on, on, on external affairs in Europe. No, I, I was wondering also if there, if don't you think that there is a deep economical reasons for this kind of... Uh, subordination that goes uh, apart the pressure from NATO, apart the ideological hegemony that we have been talking. For example, we had uh, an interview like a month ago with the, the Indian historian uh, Vijay Prashad, I don't know if you know him, and, uh, and he was trying to uh, explain the subordination of the German economic and political elites um, to, the to the dictates of Washington pointing out how the wealth of these elites is now no longer in Germany or in the old continent, but in Wall Street, no? So uh, in the form of financial assets, in particular in shares of mm. the big uh, know, monopolies, uh, in, uh, the big tech, the big seven, uh, and so on. Uh, I mean, what do you think and what do you think needs to be done to reverse this state of affairs, if, if there's something that we can do, actually. Interestingly, yes, there is, an, uh, there is certainly that, that element as well. Look, the German export economy, um, let's say, opposed to the more Anglo-Saxon kind of like the UK economy, for example. The UK was heavily deindustrialized under Margaret Thatcher and, 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 and financialized the economy. Um, heavily, so they lost their, their, their key industries, which also led to Brexit, and they are heavily financialized. The German economy was always seen as a more kind of um, industrial, you know, machinery, uh, inventories, um, chemical industry, uh, uh, automotive industry. Um, so less financialized, less, less exposed to, let's say, the Wall Street model. However, we know that, for example, the United States has a lot of leverage on extraterritorial sanctions 
Um, look, I mean, the first thing that happened, uh, because we speak about like economic sanctions. And, Sorry and, if and, I interrupt money. you. I was also wondering if uh, is an industrial model different from the financialized one. But in the last 20 years, at the end, because of the war on the on the salaries, uh, uh, I'm losing you in the in the windows. Sorry, just give me a second. And um, there has been a, a very low rate of investments, both from the public. Yeah. That, that, that from and I was wondering if they they have done. I mean, uh, it's still a, a much more industrialized kind of economy, but uh, mm. it uh, it has been financialized uh, much more than we 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 was we were understanding before, and a lot of money has been taken from the real economy and. Uh, and uh, invested in financial assets, no? the, in, the, in this capital flight oh, yeah, towards the US financial assets. You're absolutely right. I wanted to come to this point because I think um, what I was describing was more, let's say, the historical origins of the German economy, let's say, after the Second World War, right? So we always had this, this kind of um, export-oriented model because we had like raw materials, we had uh, engineering that basically dependent on foreign markets. So the whole policy that Germany did with the, like big export surplus and euro crisis was always linked to that because even part of our trade unions were incorporated in that model. So um, you would uh, produce cars and um, certainly um, developing cars, having like um, top-notch engineers that engage in, in product innovation is very expensive. So in order to to sustain that industry, you needed the external markets. And uh, cynically, you could argue that in, to some extent, um, uh, during the fascist epoch in Germany, uh, you could see how, um, you know, like uh, Germany was, um, uh, was, was, was expanding towards the East, basically. And so, I think there is more to it than than just um, that uh, uh, fascist epoch. There's also there was always a kind because of the geographic location of Germany. There is something like I would call it the genetical code of economy was expansion uh, onto uh, foreign markets. And certainly, what you need to do is with all this export revenue, you need to reinvest it. And if you suppress wages, as Germany did, and uh, you suppress internal demand there's not enough um, space to recycle your, your export earnings into the do domestic economy. So you need to invest them somewhere. And what you do is you financialize them to an extent. And certainly the US, one of the markets that we have the strongest linkages with, because after the Second World War, the United States allowed us to grow um, in line with uh, a, a deep interlinkage with, with uh, US foreign direct investment and so on. Certainly, we have this kind of exposure um, that uh, to also financialization, which has increased and so on. However, I think if you look at the um, political outcomes now, the economic outcomes of this shock, ther shock therapy to Germany, the, the energy price um, shock therapy and so on, uh, the curtailing um, uh, of our uh, relationships, economic ties with Russia. Now, if you think about Trump, maybe in the next round, trying to exert pressure on the German industry that's already starting, that they also limit their trading relationship with China, then you are in a perfect storm. And what we actually see, and that is what I, what I try to emphasize, if you think about the way the British economy developed. It was once the leading world economy. Then the shift happened after the Second World War to the United States because uh, the UK previously capitalized on the old colonial um, uh, uh, ties being like uh, a naval power. Now what happened is that the UK under Margaret Thatcher lost 
basically its 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 industry and heavily embarked on this on the strategy of financialization right so you could say that the uk is not considered anymore a major economic power some people think that this made in germany which which was born after the second world war that that the german german economic powerhouse is somehow a given which would continue to persist forever and i don't want also to like i mean there is still a lot of industrial capacity in germany and 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 and, and economic clusters and 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 um, a, a tradition of engineering and all that exists however i think it's perfectly thinkable that in the next 10 to 20 years um in the in the in the in the textbooks of the historians we will say the war in ukraine was a catalyst after which we saw the demise of the German industry. And I think Bloomberg, The Economist, a lot of media outlets have already discussed that. And so I think that while you are right that the, the let's say, the power of extraterritorial sanctions and also the financialization of the German economy and the ties with Wall Street may have contributed to that scenario, you can clearly study that this is not, it is, nevertheless a self-defeating strategy because um, actually we are now making we are actually embarking on a policy that is hurting ourselves more and um, I don't think that also for domestic political reasons this policy can continue so at some point German policymakers will be actually forced to have a more confrontative stance also with US policy, because otherwise I think there will be huge repercussions in, in elections. So um, I think that there's a limit to the um, there's a limit to the complicity of the German political establishment in 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 actually uh, continuing uh, yeah, a self-devastating policy. And it's interesting again that I talked about Galbraith earlier, that a critical discussion about this is more freely taking place in, in the United States and a uh, um, realistic assessment of the state of the German economy than in Germany itself. So um, what is currently happening in Germany, though, is that this crisis of the German industrial model, which was exposed, basically we were the winner in the euro crisis because we suppressed uh, demand everywhere in Europe, but we used the southern European economies as a workshop, uh, we had uh, cheap sources of migrant labor, uh, we had like capital flight from, from the middle classes in Italy and Greece to German banks, and we used basically the rest of Europe as, um, how can I say, as an assembly line to export our goods to China, right? And this period now is over because now we have this huge Mm, due to the economic sanction, we have this huge shock uh, in the global economy. And so the the strength of the German economy to being exposed to to the to the um, emerging economies in the East now turns into weakness because of the the the, the economic warfare that we currently have in the international arena. And we don't really have a strategy because um you see a lot of people now agree we have complete underfunding of public investment, but we have over years enshrined in our constitution a policy regime that was completely geared towards that export-led model uh, with a debt break. And now you need a two-third majority to change that in the constitution. And you have um, the political right rising. And so basically we are trapped in a kind of institutional setup that doesn't allow us to escape that arrangement that has been built recklessly by the German political elites over the last years. And so what may happen is that what very happened, very often happens in politics, that actually people analyze on a political level, Germany needs to change, needs to invest more, for example, needs to do more public investment, more industrial policy, but at the same time, we have built a network of structures like the debt break enshrined in our constitution, and we don't have the political majorities. 
and also the, the rise of the right wing that is opposed to changing the debt break is a reaction to this policy regime. So we are basically faced with multiple crises, constitutional crises, uh, and so on, industrial crisis, and we cannot solve it because our political establishment has basically um, uh, put us into a cage, into a situation which is not adaptable to the new realities. And so I think uh, that while you're right to say that uh, there were so-called economic incentives to, you know, like follow the U.S. lead because maybe there were some assets and so on invested in the United States, still the overall outcome is that I think the German industry is hurt by it. And a lot of actors in the German industry actually opposed. They are opposed to that policy regime. So that's the interesting situation um, because I think there's also, you know, there, 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 is a, um, there is a contradiction between, let's say, financial and industrial capital there as well. No, 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 no. That's, that, that, that's real, cl really clearly explained. But now, because you anticipated that, that this connection between the, uh, the industrialization, uh, economical crisis, and the rising of the, the far right, no? And uh, uh, I mean, like, uh, against this uh, rise of the far right, uh, uh, the liberal left have tried to respond with a kind of you no know, call to arms against the danger of the rise of the radical right and in defense of liberal democracy do you what's your alternative uh, i mean do, do do these work and what's if it doesn't work what's your alternative uh, receipt uh, recipe no it obviously doesn't work and um there is Uh, even like uh, you could say uh, a scientific um, response to that because there was a big study conducted I think uh, with the participation of Swedish central bankers uh, which is called I think the political cost of austerity uh, which was published I think also by MIT in the United States and they analyzed 200 European elections and they basically came to the conclusion that austerity is nurturing right-wing parties i mean, look, look at Italy. Also, Meloni is, um, uh, you know, uh, attacking the welfare state and she's clearly on the NATO line and so on. If you look at the trajectory of Italy, you know, a lot of left liberals were cheerful when Berlusconi received that letter from the ECB that basically forced them to, to, to step down and, and that demanded more austerity from Italy. In Italy, you had, I think, between uh, the 1990s and um, uh, 2020, when Corona broke out, 28 of 30 years where there was a primary surplus, so uh, a budget surplus before interest payment. And nevertheless, the debt to GDP quota never went down because the economy was basically in a coma. And on top of it, you had the Euro um, and, 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 and the very um, uh, problematic uh, uh, um, conditions for the Italian economy, especially uh, due also to, to the German export uh, uh, strategy. And um, so, so if you look at this situation, And you look how many technocratic governments Italy then had. Uh, you had the Monti. I don't know how many people you had. Monti, Letta, you know, like um, all these people. And then ultimately, if you look, when the, 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 the government, then with Conte and then with Draghi, when that situation broke down, it actually broke down also over dispute of the energy relationships with, uh, with Russia in part. And now you have Meloni. Look what happened in Greece, right? Um, you, had, uh, you had Alexis Tsipras, you had Syriza in Greece, and then you had basically uh, a, a lot of hopes and public support, even with a popular vote being called against the austerity policies. And then when um, uh, Syriza accepted the conditions of the creditors and basically had the worst of two worlds. So first they asked the people to go to the polls, 
The people said, oh, the people said no to the austerity policies. And then basically they capitulated. That led to a situation. Now you have a president of the Syriza party who is a, a former investment bank in the United States who was in favor of um, Thatcher style policies in Greece. And he was elected into that office on the back of a lot of social media campaigning on Instagram and identity politics. So you can see basically that there's a pattern in the Western European left that they have been severely defeated. And you could say the same for social democracy. Look, we have now the European elections. And I mean, von der Leyen is not at all popular in Germany. She's not. But she has no risk of losing that election because basically social democracy by being complicit in the euro crisis in these like austerity policies have been destroyed as a popular party and so the only political space that was left to protest was the right and the absurdity of it is that the afd in germany is a very much market radical party in many regards they also have now like a right wing um like an extreme right wing wing, which is trying to, you know, like mm, advance social demands because they think it's probably the better strategy to 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 um, to appeal to to working class voters. But you can clearly see, I mean, that the AfD was was a f fairly weak force. They had a small peak during the euro crisis. Then we had uh, the whole regime change wars in the, in the Middle East. We had the refugee crisis and the AFD became established force. Now you have the new German government and after um, um, the, 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 the sanctions spiral and um, after, um, uh, you know, like uh, hike in energy prices and so on, um, suddenly the AFD was rising again and um, that is part of the reason why we said with the Bündnis Sarah Wagenknecht, we need um, a popular social response to that threat, which doesn't make the same mistakes that a political, traditional political left has made on embarking on, on, on a cultural war with the AfD, because that will actually help them. I mean, there's clearly, I will always in my life oppose racism, in example, but still it is a wrong strategy to say that, for example, um, the migration crisis has not also had negative knock-on effects in Germany. For example, we have complete underfunding of housing. So it, it does exert in certain municipalities some pressure on, on the housing market or in our education system. We have schools where uh, only a minority of children still speaks German. This is not the fault of the migrants. Um, and now you could always argue, yes, then let's just invest more public money, but still it is not a viable solution um, because uh, it takes uh, many years, you know, like to, to, to create that space on the housing market. So we need, obviously, for example, a solution that is our conviction that we need to have a more a uh, regulated approach to migration, so protecting people who are in in need of, of asylum, who whose life is in danger, who are politically persecuted, then we need a mechanism. But we have a lot of um, economic migration as well for understandable reasons, because we were a part in destroying um, the, their countries of origin. But we will not solve that situation only by the route of migration. Um, and it is also not a very humanitarian response. And at the same time, some people of the, let's say, identity left that were um, saying that, you know, like having a more like, let's say, open border approach to things, were completely mute on the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, where we currently have an, like two million people who are basically uh, refugees in, in, in their own territory. And these are the contradictions of these kind of policies. And that's where we want um, basically to also be an electoral alternative, because we don't believe that if the AFD jumps, let's say, from uh, 8 to 10 and then to 20 percent, that 
20% of the German electorate overnight have become right-wing extremists. You know, that is not a very, you know, like it, it's not a very successful strategy to, if, if you tell people whenever you dissent, for example, with the economic policies, with the foreign policies, you are a kind of, of, of right-wing Nazi, then they start to, to vote these parties. And that's, I think, um, where the political left made grave errors and uh, where we think uh, we need uh, a new development in the, in the in the German party system in order to prevent that the AfD is constantly rising also in the polls. No, I was wondering because now the the, the receipt is somehow start to uh, start again to invest, start again to invest in uh, uh, industrial production, start again to make the real economy uh, uh, grow again. No, but. How it works from you, you are running from the European election, no? Uh, and in the past, the Germany, German success, industrial success, has been based also on a kind of predatory relation to the rest of Europe, Absolutely. no? How, how can it so? So now we have neo protectionist uh, uh, initiatives from the US that are attracting all these investment from Europe and we have to react to this, no? How can we react to this uh, uh, and taking together the German uh, interest uh, and uh, the other European countries' interest? So how can we find a, a, a solution to these contradictory interests? In yeah. Look, there are two answers to this. First of all, and that's what we, we've been saying already um, when I was a member of of the left uh, during the Euro crisis. I've been always one of the most loudest critique of the German um, Euro policies. We never said, so we, we are not saying Germany shouldn't have export relationships, but one way to narrow the export surplus and to like um, address the imbalances in Europe has been to stimulate your domestic economy more and import more. So it, it, it is not purely exporting less in absolute terms. It's also importing more and creating more space for other countries to export. And if we think about mm, uh, what China, the United States is currently doing in terms of uh, R&D investment, uh, artificial intelligence and, and like energy infrastructure and however you, you judge some of these investments. However, what we need is a big kind of... Um, public investment-led program, which would automatically also stimulate domestic demand without curtailing us from certain crucial, for example, energy relationships. Um, and so we are basically, we are not advocating, and that is currently happening. So part of the industrial class in Germany is now trying to shift the burden of adjustment to labor again, like saying, okay, we have this alignment where German industry has a real cost problem, for example, with energy prices, and now we shift it again to labor. That is certainly not a policy that we would support as, as Bündnis Sarah Wagenknecht. Uh, and we would not say that what we need is a kind of like mercantilist export strategy to the other world. But we say we need uh, industrial policies that um, are connected with with public investment. So public investment into research and development um, that basically help to preserve our industrial core, but without embarking on a permanent policy of, of, of beggar thy neighbor. Um, and so uh, certainly let's take the automotive sector, right? Just to, to, to make a specific example. We have the ban on combustion engines now in, in the European Union. Um, we are not convinced that this is uh, a smart way to address also environmental concerns. Um, why? First of all, we believe that um, in, in generally speaking, when it comes to environmental policies, we are in favor of um, a structural transformation of our economies, environmental transformation of our economy, but we believe it should not be done via excessive uh, uh, carbon pricing. 
because what happens is if you are a working class family and you live in a rural constituency in Germany and you don't have a good public transport, you will still be dependent on your car to commute to the city because you cannot afford the rent there anymore. And so you will not adjust. Especially your... after 20 years of disinvesting in the railway that brought exactly. the, the German railway worse than the Italian one. Exactly. Now the Italian is better, uh, I swear to you. So my father was Italian. He was always, um, uh, he, he, when he was in Germany, he was so happy about how like everything worked. And now he's shocked when he's here. You know, like um, I, I'm taken very often a train in Italy. At least La Freccia Rossa is more more reliable than, 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 than our railway system. And interestingly, interestingly, uh, like, so, and, 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 and high income households are not very sensitive to carbon pricing. So we are saying, basically, there's a lot of economic evidence that uh, if you want environmental guidance of, of uh, or uh, environmental transformation of the economy, you need uh, credit guidance, uh, public led investment um, into that sector. That's that's one part. And that's where we deviate from the whole Green New Deal rhetoric of, of, of the European Commission. And then there's a second, um, there's a second uh, uh, aspect that we certainly need a smart policy. So yes, we want to support renewable energy, but we will need as a bridge into the non-fossil era, we will need some gas, right? And The gas from Russia, for example, is environmentally less damaging than LNG gas imports. Then there's a third aspect. We, when we come to the, to the ban of combustion cars, to give you an example, we know for sure that in a lot of the so-called developing countries, let's say South Africa, where you have electricity um, blackouts because you don't have enough electricity uh, production, we will not have electric cars for a long time to come. So their combustion cars will still be driven because they also have a total lack of a good public transport infrastructure. So what the German if you what the German contribution could be to use the advantage that Germany has, that the past dependent advantage in combustion engines to basically give stricter targets to German combustion uh, to, to the German automotive industry to produce less damaging, um, uh, 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 environmentally damaging uh, combustion uh, cars. To give you an example, certainly one big focus must be to reduce the need for ind individual transportation by supporting public transport. So to reduce the overall level. But now in Germany, a lot of families that are wealthier households buy electric cars With formerly we had like incentives for that, like um, tax incentives and so on, and they 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 buy these as a second car. So there's no really there's not really a contribution uh, to the environment, and then also those cars, the, the electricity you know it, it doesn't come from the plug, it comes from somewhere, and so if you have um, like now you have like the energy sanctions, you have a lot of pressure on the energy grid. If you charge the electric car, very often uh, it will be during peak times also energy from coal, for example. So you cannot measure the environmental impact of electric cars. Then you have the battery cycle, uh, the life cycle of the batteries. So you also have a lot of damaging impact there. And so we, for example, the conservatives are now attacking the ban on uh, combustion cars. But what they want is simply the old business model, to continue the bus old business model. We are also criticizing the ban on combustion cars, not because we are against electric cars, but we think we need to mix because combustion cars will still be driven for a long time in other countries. And we need to provide incentives to build more efficient combustion cars, um, uh, for example, for the export market, um, so that we can help to reduce um, to reduce environmental impact in other countries. And there is, for example, a debate around e-fuels. This is basically CO2 emissions that are being used when you produce energy. And they are basically, so it's energy that is already used and you take the CO2 emissions that basically happen while you, you know, have that energy consumption and then you try 
to um, uh, use that in for 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 so-called uh, e-fuels. So now the e-fuels are still in a very mm, nation state where you would prioritize them for airlines, for ships, but you could think about, um, and there are already experiments, for example, in Chile taking place um, to, to spur the, the production of alternative energies in a lot of developing countries, which still have huge capacity because they have sun, sun they have wind, they have energy, uh, um, a lot of the conditions. And you could help with supporting uh, alternative energy production there, um, generating more capacity for e-fuels and use those to reduce the emissions of combustion cars. Just to give you a specific technological example where we deviate from the official line, which is a kind of greenwashing um, of technological solutions that will not work because now the German federal agency that oversees our electrical grid has said that they have warned that there will be power outages in Germany because too many private households will be loading their electric cars. So not everything which is sold on the label of green policies is a sober green policy. And our differentiation from the political right would be that we say, yes, we want to allow to play out the traditional strengths of the German industry, for example, in combustion engines, but we want to combine it with stricter emission targets um, so that we want to have like a kind of state-led industrial policy which requires them to, for example, um, limit also the size of their cars and, and the, the heaviness of the cars combined with incentives and, and, and partnerships with, um, uh, for example, developing and emerging economies to increase their energy uh, capacities. And, and, and this is the kind of economic relationships that we envisage. And we are very aware that Germany cannot base its like industrial model on, on, on you know, bigger tie neighbor policies. Sounds great. Uh, Ali, if you have uh, one last question and we... Oh, just one brief, brief, brief question. It's more a reflection. And I wanted to know if you, if you agree with me or not, uh, uh, Fabio. Because uh, um, I'd say that culturally, the, um, uh, the most difficult things to do now is to convince people that, uh, uh, especially uh, in Germany, but also in Italy, to convince them that concepts like uh, sovereignty, nation, uh, uh, fight for the um, cultural, economic, military independence of the Europe from the USA. Those concepts uh, are the, probably the most leftist concepts and tools that we have now for the emancipation of the popular classes. So that's the cultural uh, challenge, would they say, because otherwise, uh, uh, if we say sovereignty, if we say nation, if we say fight for independence immediately uh, in this uh, kind of um, uh, ideology that uh, you were saying, uh, there is a association with, with some uh, uh, right concepts and uh, bad nationalism and, and so. I don't know if, uh, if you agree with that. Absolutely. I mean, especially in Germany, um, uh, also to an extent in Italy, due to, to our history, there is this concept that that equates the nation state with um, with uh, fascism, uh, nationalism and dominance over others. It's very interesting because if you look into um, one of the most like left wing, um, um, uh, like lyricists and, 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 and poets in Germany, Bertolt Brecht, he once composed uh, the so-called children's hymn, which was an alternative ve version, basically, of the national anthem. And um, the, the, the core essence of the lyrics was that uh, we love a country as others love this, and we don't want to be um, above nor underneath um, others. You know, like that was basically the, the core message of that anthem. And I think uh, that shows that uh, there has been, you know, like a kind of due to the German history, um, there has been a confusion also, I think, in, in some of the concepts, because the nation state, first of all, is a concept of um, uh, of democracy. So uh, basically in the, in, the, in the realm of the nation state, 
Uh, you try to organize democracy, you try to organize a collective solidarity, let's say the pension system, the welfare system, and so on, which is certainly reliant on certain legal definitions and boundaries. So if you want to 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 maintain a huge social consensus between uh, like the working classes and let's say the unemployed, you need a certain proximity that people who 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 get payouts they also contributed to the system and this is defined by the boundaries of a nation state because you know france italy has other traditions or scandinavia of their social welfare systems and i try to always say to the people look if you look at the us uh, united states uh, the us economy um yes they have a centralized parliament in washington but they also have a democracy that is hijacked by a big capital, you know, like you can only run for president if you have like these big campaign contributions. If you would now shift all our policymaking to the European level, what you would get is um, more big money interests and less democratic control. In some arenas, European cooperation perfectly makes sense. So if we want to combat, let's say, tax dumping by multinational corporations, it makes sense that we have a international coordination to define minimum corporate tax rates. And exactly there, what we get is always that people tell us, oh, there's nothing we can do because, I don't know, Luxembourg is opposing it, you know, like some tax haven is opposing it. So we always get this bad cop, good cop game where there's one veto player. And this is exactly where the European Union could make a difference in the lives of people. But why even there, the nation state can be important because if Germany and France teamed up and would be saying, okay, if Amazon or Apple is not paying their fair share of taxes um, in, in Germany or France, we take the share of the revenues that they make in Germany because we have we have data on we have the so-called country per country reporting where we can see how many iPhones Apple sells in Germany and if it's I don't know 30% of their overall turnover in Europe then they have to tax 30% of the European profits here and then we would do a national source taxation and we say we don't care whether you shift your profits to Ireland but we will tax you at the base. If Germany and France would have the lead in such an initiative based on their like national laws, it would also help to find a better international solution because it would exert pressure on those corporations. So I think that this kind of narrative also sometimes in the political left that the antithesis to 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 nationalism is always the European level is wrong. Look at the Troika during the European uh, during the Euro crisis, it was a kind of supranational decision making, and we all know it was not more democratic. You know, it overruled popular votes in Greece. So I think the nation state must be a positive point of reference, but not in the sense of dominating other countries or of like uh, uh, um, um, nationalism, but in the sense of. Um, creating a level playing field where democracy can play out. And um, I mean, there are very specific examples. If you look in the European treaties, there are the so-called EU battle groups. And one of the requirements in European lawmaking is that um, in, in Germany, for example, you cannot send German fighting troops to other countries without a vote in parliament. But if European law requires us to be flexible, to contribute to, to, to European battle troops, German soldiers, and then the requirement by European law is that we basically change our constitutional requirements and that we allow um, also German soldiers to be sent into wars without prior consent from the parliament. That is not about more Europe or more nation state, this means this translates into less democracy, right? And I think that is one of the problems that we're, we're facing in that discourse. And the problem is that culturally speaking, the right wing, which, you know, uh, appeals to that kind of protective nation state, is better to appeal to popular classes because they never gave up that territory of the, let's say, Republican nation state. And so I think we need to rebuild uh, a, 
a progressive narrative of the democratic nation state um, in order to give people the feeling that they have a sense of control over their lives in this era of globalized hypercapitalism. And whether you, you, you talk about like uh, Islamist, um, reactionary Islamist groups, they are also a reaction, you know, in some sense to this kind of, of era because um, a lot of them have risen on the back of, you know, uh, organizing limited local welfare systems, for example. You find that in a lot of reactionary movements. If you look at Orban in Hungary, the first thing he did is when he came to power, he fired his uh, like central bank president, regulated the banks, and he he he, he provided uh, some like social redistribution. So you can he he was an, antagonizing Brussels, and that's the problem that we always try to tackle the right wing on the cultural level, where very often it helps them because mm, they can try to you know like portray the left as being far removed from the interests of the popular classes. And, 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 and that's the thing that I think is a grave error. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fabio, for this, uh, for this conversation. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, listening to us. And we see us in the next episode. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And, and we hope to, to have Fabio again soon because it's... Yeah, really hope it's...